Hello and welcome back. Today I will discuss a very general issue, which is how to practice best. You may guess that there is more than one best way to practice for all the diversity of people. I put here a lot of important points together and I found it hard to put it into a logical sequence since they all somehow interrelate so best refer to the section to find one issue after the other. To start with, what setup is the best? Is there something which everyone has in common? Yes, in fact, some points, and I start with that. One, don't pack your cello away every time. Open the case up once you are at home and leave the cello at a spot where it is safe and accessible, so it looks inviting and worthwhile to play even for five minutes. My cello is ready to play, not left in a case. Bridge hidden so it can't get knocked. Bowl ready, chair ready, music on the stand. If you have pets, one clip to secure the case is enough. Case on the floor on the side, safer than standing up, ready to get the cello. And now, when is best to practice? Is there something in general? Before I go into details of practice sessions, it is interesting to know what brain research says about when is the best time to concentrate and to practice. I have this information from a new study in a book titled The Older, the Better. Je älter, desto besser, in German. It's about that even if you learn a bit slower when we are older, you waste less time doing stupid things and in the wrong way. Anyway, according to research, our brain works best from about 11 a.m. to about 12.30, before lunch. And our brain activity is at this time up to 100% better than all the rest of the day. It took me by total surprise that there is anything like this at all. The test was done in Switzerland by one of these underground channels where they test the speed of particles underground and so on. And they were volunteers. They had access to everything they needed except time. So not even the day was given. And they could switch the lights on whenever they wished. And so they had meals whenever they wished, they had all the entertainment whenever they wished. And with all, without exception, it turned out that this was the highest brain activity. During the rest of the day is different for most people. Some are very good, very early. Others work well till late at night. And try to work it out and test when you play best. Usually, after meals, concentration is lower. Therefore, the hour before meals is better. Also, in the morning for most, the theoretical part works better, like new material, new pieces. But in the evening, the fingers flow easier. They are less stiff. We also rush less in the evening, which brings in an added quality. In the evening, we play more musical, and it flows better. A good time to play complete pieces. And now are the necessary cello playing preparation exercises. I've seen several preparation exercises before even taking the cello in the hand and never did any of them. I feel they're like a spanner thrown into looking forward to play. They are really unnecessary. If your body needs exercises, you do them in the morning, and, but they have nothing to do with playing cello. The best warm-up exercises are on the cello. I saw even a callus build-up exercise before playing. You roll your fingers and you build up your callus. But in reality, one minute of playing a real cello, except open strings, builds up callus much faster. The best preparation is, as said before, having the cello 
including music and share as accessible as possible. Now I want to mention short practices. I wish to add the value of short practices. Sometimes I have a section in mind and have suddenly an idea how to improve it. Then I go to my cello, play just that bit until I get it, and stop about five minutes. I learned something. When my kids were little, and I did most of the childminding, the preparation for concerts relied on mostly practices between five and fifteen minutes. There is so much more to getting better than a rigid standard schedule. I though might mention I always warmed up for a minute. Now, how long should a regular practice be? Well, the world's top performers recommend not to exceed more than a practice session beyond 45 minutes. Concentration declines and there's no benefit to go on when the mind is tired. Take a break, have a cup of tea, do something else, unless you are so excited that you don't feel tired at all. Observing as a teacher, you will progress reasonably well if you practice at least four times a week, 20 to 30 minutes. Anything more makes progress faster, and anything less might make you stagnant. I suggest practicing at least five minutes every single day. And by miracle, these practices go often longer. When I studied, there were students who practiced four to six hours a day. And having heard that, I asked them and I found out these times were not really honest. They did that once or twice a week and had excuses for the other days. I also failed to hear the benefits. It was a matter of pride. When preparing a difficult concert, my practice could, up, could get up to three practice sessions a day. And I mean up to. If every now and then we miss a day, it doesn't matter. Even two days don't if it's not regular. In fact, little breaks can be not that bad. For a beginner, I recommend to do smaller practices. Pieces are short and it's hard to fill even half an hour. It's better to practice twice or even three times five to ten minutes than dragging on until, until pieces get longer. Also with many beginners, the thumb or something else hurts after a while. Take a little break, try to lighten the thumb and see the sofa exercise in the video how to get a good sound. In general, when something hurts, stop for about 10 seconds and often it fades. If not, ask your teacher or someone whom you could ask about it. Playing with pain turns often into unnaturally compensation movements and that can up in more pain. I must not forget to mention a tiny suggestion. Sometimes things don't seem to work and for no reason it doesn't sound right, doesn't feel right. And if that happens, put the cello down, walk through the room, come back and try again. And miraculously, that can often fix the problem. And now to the start of practice. And I go first to a common pattern. I learned the following routine. Play first scales, then exercises, then studies, and last, the pieces I was working on. The progress was really slow compared to today, although I was young. Once I came to the pieces, my mind was tired. All freshness was wasted on repetitive material in which I often drifted off. Also, the repetitiveness reduced my attention so much that intonation and sound quality suffered or were not considered. And gradually it dawned to me, against all the practice plans, that high concentration is an asset not to waste. But on the other hand, that a certain warm-up is essential. 
and how to get the best of both. So a much more useful pattern I found is two to three minutes warm up. And gradually this pattern emerged. Never start with anything fast. It tenses up the fingers and ends up un uncontrolled and very disappointing. And often we blame, oh, that was bad. And absolutely first is tuning every time, either by ear or digital. After tuning, I start always with a slow scale, in fact, usually C or D. The open strings ring, and when you play in tune, you get feedback from the cello for being in tune. The cello says, thank you, that was why. And warming up is not just the warming up the fingers. It's a bit like a meditation, getting thoughts away from everyday issues, like messages, emails, shopping, and so on. And at the start of the scale, my sound intonation is often actually average. And after this slow scale, my mind is with the cello. Intonation is good. Sound control is there. My mind has switched from all the other issues to the cello. If you're not a beginner, use vibrato, but maybe not the first beats. I vibrate only a bit, a wobble without tension. Everyone, of course, plays a number of octaves from two to four according to their level. And this scale takes about two minutes and will make you play better for the rest of the day. After the slow scale, I play flowing seven in one bow with only the key note longer. And I just play them first. The first scale, scale is and so on. And each note has three beats and I start without vibrato. I listen for the bow at the beginning that it makes a good sound. You might have heard it came straight away, which means I played earlier today. I mean, I would have played before starting. It sometimes doesn't come straight away because my mind is not with it. And then follows, I go through actually four octaves. And when you're advanced, it's the best thing to do to get actually relaxed with all four octaves. And then follows the scale seven in one bow with this. so on. And I play always the four octaves, first slow and twice faster. If you skip your scales, of course nothing bad happens, but your first piece will be disappointing, maybe even the second one. And I found with a scale, less mistakes happen, concentration is higher, the sound is better, and you actually you gain more or less 15 minutes of concentration in your practice if you play these short scales. And now I go to the first piece. Many play often exercises to play mechanically in effect without listening, just for the fingers, like Cosman and Feuillard. And they don't make anyone actually a better player. They're only good for players who enjoy finger movements, like typewriting, for the sake of it. We need not to forget that exercises were written at a time where home entertainment didn't exist. No radio, no TV, no videos. And if you like music, you might as well fill the time up with it, if it's useful or not, because it's better than doing nothing. And these unmusical exercises can also make you getting used to be sort of in tune, meaning not really in tune just the right finger close enough to be not really out of tune. It's the same for playing half an hour fast scales. It makes your tensor player, sound quality and accurate intonation declines. The whole idea of doing first something purely technical and boring goes back to an old educational idea. You need to do something unpleasant in order to be rewarded with the pleasure of good music. Wait and collect brownie points and do something unpleasant. Duties first. 
Well, there are better ideas than that. Let's start better with an old piece, a known favorite. It can be short, but shouldn't be a too fast one. Focusing on sound and intonation, or a new piece under speed. To go straight into a difficult new piece in speed, it's usually pretty bad and ends up in disappointment. I mean, we are only three minutes off of starting totally. There's another aspect to playing a piece we know already well. Looking at, uh, that might be interesting, with which pieces I learned most, became a really better cellist. There are pieces I could play already without a mistake and by memory. How could that be? Being secure and knowing the notes well, that is when real improvement can start. We start noticing details we have never noticed before. Our mind is open and free to discover additional bits. It's like having a magnifying glass on every single note and how they interrelate. You might have experienced when your car doesn't work, then you have to walk somewhere. And if you walk somewhere, oh, I've never seen this hedge, I've never seen this door entrance, I've never seen this. In music it is exactly the same. And the more you know things, the more you rely on it, the more additional details you can notice. In a new piece, you have not even a hundredth of knowledge about each note as you have when we can play it well. And best is that I recommend it to have a folder with all pieces you can play well and want to keep playing them as well. A favorites folder. I might mention as well, when you go through the pieces, security declines as soon as a feeling of rushing creeps in. It's not only a waste of time, it harms intonation, sound quality, creates unhelpful tensions, takes then away the smoothness of shifts. We don't need that. Well, now after the favorite, how to work best on a new piece. The concentration is still to be high. If you think three minutes the scale, then it comes a favorite piece, five to ten minutes, so we're not yet that far in. When playing something new, it is important to integrate all elements as soon as possible. Bowings have to be right, fingerings have to be right. We might run it once or twice through roughly, but then we either need to play exactly the written fingerings and bowings, or we have to write hours in. If you play repeatedly a wrong finger or bowing, write the correct one in. Don't get used to correcting the mistake. And have a pencil ready, and if you don't like the fingerings, write them in. Don't get used to that you see the third finger, but you play the fourth. Don't do it. Write your fourth finger in, or whatever, but play what is written. It is an essential discipline. As soon as we are able to play it in a speed of context, timing has to be right. If we ignore one of these key elements, we would install mistakes and have to relearn. The fastest way of learning is going slowly through and watch that everything is correct. Then we don't need to relearn and can just move on. Once we speed up a bit, dynamics and expressions should be included every time. To play without expression is a silly idea because we practice without expression. Speed is the only element which can be changed. And the best pattern I found is play new pieces or the passages to work on three times. Two times slow and the third time a bit faster with dynamics. These settings of two times slow and third time a bit faster should be kept until it flows without a mistake. You can even do it two or three times. Two times slow, one times fast, didn't work. Two times slow, one times fast, a bit better, do it one time more. You will get a feeling for if two or three times is enough for a piece 
or section, or if you need to play a section five or eight times. I talk here about playing a piece three times. I need to clarify this unit has not to be too long. If a work has eight pages, we can't play it three times. I found the best amount is to maximum two pages. The process should feel untiring. If you need to prepare a performance quickly, I recommend taking even a bit less. So if you can go through the process two plus one, twice or more, without feeling exhausted. It's not good to start and stop. The rhythm and flow have to go on. Like the idea of playing a piece, making a mistake, going one note back and doing it, you practice a mistake. It will never go better until you get rid of it and start earlier. It is better to keep in mind where we made the mistake. The rhythm and flow have to go on. It would be a waste to correct a one time of wrong note and go back and lose the flow. We need to learn to allow this one wrong note but keep it in mind. So after a passage, particularly when you have played it twice, you should know what was wrong and then practice it. I might mention as well, I found it very helpful and useful that every practice has a little goal. Like after this practice I want to be able to play this passage better, this shift, this note, the vibrato of that note, the piece as a whole, and so on. This attitude makes one move forward, not playing habitual. So you start a practice and say, after this practice today, I want to know this better. And every day you have some little thing where you play better than yesterday. It makes us involved in a much fuller way. And this tiny attitude makes you a better player. What is my goal of this practice? I wish to mention two little things which help me a lot. And the first is, I call it, practicing backwards. You might have noticed it happens that when we start always at the beginning of the piece, the beginning gets better and better and the end never. Once I can play the first part okay, I start my practice with the last section towards the last note, like not playing back backwards. Then I work my way section by section from the end to the middle until the two parts meet up. I can only recommend that. The second little thing is, don't start always at the nut, even in a down bow. Watch the amount of bow that note would take. Where do you want to end up? with the bow, to be prepared for the next longer note, or short bow, or an accent. The first note might sound better if starting 10 cm off the nut, or frog. If starting with an up bow, it doesn't mean it needs to start at the tip. In fact, quite often, quite close to the frog or nut, if the up bow is short, but often it sounds better to start even in the middle and I encourage to experiment where the bow starts best, not habitually starting at either end. You connected with this point, experiment with uneven bow speed. Each note in fact needs its own speed, each note according to which string, which dynamic and which kind of sound. And many long notes need a speed change during the note due to crescendo or diminuendo. And I take here a B because in many pieces, including World Sentimental, The Swan, Rachmanina Vocalisi, they all like the long Bs. I don't know why. And I take here the Swan. One, two, three, four. So for the first four beats, one, two, three, four, I have a third of the bow only for four beats because I come the crescendo. So 
The last two beats kind of a crescendo because they have more beam, more, more speed. The whole idea that you have even both speed is just nonsense. It doesn't exist. On each string you need it, on each dynamic is different. Then every uh, quarter note or crotchet has a different speed, different dynamic. So it doesn't exist. So look on which part of the bow and which amount of bow and how heavy. It's every single note demands something different. And now, why do we practice? Why, would, why don't we just play? And that's an insight into repetition. The reason for surprise is we repeat many more details than just playing the notes. And often we might not even know. For example, we repeat how we did something. With elements involved, we would never think of. We learn by repeating all elements which are involved with our playing. This includes joy, fear, hesitation, tension, postures, little pauses, little errors, and of course fingerings and bowings. It doesn't help when we know they are wrong. Knowledge doesn't make it better, only doing. Then there are bad sounds occurring, unwanted, and often if you record yourself at the same spots repeatedly. Even how we sit is associated with particular pieces, slouched or straight. If our shoulders are raised, now we put our feet. We don't even think about it. And all these elements are associated and we foster them when we do it again. I can't forget a concert in which a very good pianist played a Beethoven sonata and there was a scale in octave parallels. And suddenly the sonata seemed interrupted by an essential practice for the pianist of scales. If the pianist forgot that he was in the concert hall and practiced scales at home. And why did this happen? Because the pianist had practiced parallel octaves unengaged and unmusical, he was not able to play them without the trained boredom, although he demonstrated in the concert that he was a musical person. So, if we play, like I mentioned before, exercise for only the fingers with a bad sound, we practice bad sound. If the intonation is not good, we practice being very tolerant towards bad intonation. And I go on, it means also when we stop in a piece, because we are not sure of the next note, we practice stopping. And it's likely we stop the next time again. If you have to correct a note, we practice first playing wrong and then correct. We play both, not the correct note only. And I know this frightening fact from concerts, how fast we learn. When I made a mistake, and often it was the first time, then in the repeat, like in a Bach suite, I would likely to do the same mistake again. Although I never made it, I learned it once in the concert, I do it again. And sometimes we can learn by only doing things once. The only method of correction is we need to unpractice. Unpractice the stop, the wrong note, the note out of tune. We need to identify, keep in mind the spots and select them to practice slower, very consciously, note by note, several times, maybe several days, until the cor correct way feels natural. I recommend not just to start to the, at the mistake, but at a bar or measure, a few bars or measures before, so that we learn to integrate the newly learned passage and don't stop due to the unpreparedness of our mind. Like if we practice a tiny section and we play it all through, we might trip. So we need to practice it from a little while before that it can integrate. From my experience, changing speed is the only thing which we can change. Once a slow version is secure, we can speed up. But rushing can create new mistakes plus tensions.
The best way to practice is, of course, playing no mistake, no rush and in time. That means we play first under speed until everything is right. I find waiting and thinking might be okay if you don't expect yet a regular flow. Cramming and rushing, even in slow speed, leads to errors and is not good. Better slow and correct. If we can allow it at the very beginning, when we play slowly through, to think. So some forgiveness is there. Many pieces have a difficult passage. As mentioned before, I play them usually two times slow and then at speed. All aspect practiced. And if it doesn't work yet, I repeat the set of twice slow plus once fast. Again, ten times fast just makes you tense and accurate. Just bring it. I want to show here an example of an element which is often missed. The amount of bow we are practicing with, even when we play slow. This is a section from Squire's Tarantella. Many students have problems with it. And although they practice it all the time, but they usually practice this. And when they have to practice it fast, then it is too much bow. So how do we do that? So in speed, because it's faster, we use only that much bow. So we play it fast. It's the same amount of bow as if you play it slow. And all aspects need to be correct. Intonation, bowing, fingering, bow direction, amount of bow, wear on the bow and also dynamics and even interpretation and involvement. Because, as in the example with a pianist, we can practice uninvolvement when we play uninvolved. I remember the great violinist Isaac Stern saying, whatever you play, every note comes from somewhere and goes somewhere, is embedded in a musical flow. The habit of playing anything in an unmusical way is in fact musically destructive. A student once came to me and had heard of a TED talk that if you practice 10,000 hours you can get anything. He wanted to learn just Bach Prelude 1 from Sweet 1. He had practiced years couldn't play long because it hurt. His sound was terrible and he knew it. His intonation was not good and he heard it. Had never been able to play it once through. He played about for 10 to 15 years. The TED talker should be charged, I think, with all the bills to physios at least. When they're ignorant, they should just not talk publicly. But this talk is followed by many and made the life of many people worse. If you practice clever, you can learn very fast. And if you don't practice clever, you can get so stuck it harms and you virtually don't progress. And if you did for 10 years wrong, it's stuck. And if your routine is not clever, so you learn slow. I go now to the structure of the practice. Because many students seem to think it needs to be exactly the same for a whole week. And um, I don't think so. A lot of students like a daily routine, seven days the same. But I noticed that they stop improving once they can play a piece okay. Being unbound in my practice for years to a weekly or fortnightly lesson, I found out that playing seven days or fortnight the same a change after seven days, it's not very effective. Playing a piece once daily doesn't create necessarily improvement. Concentration drops back, imperfections are taken for granted and are not corrected. 
and I have therefore different programs for different days, like day A and day B program, and sometimes even three or four programs. Often I ask myself, what would today work best? If on the next day comes something else, then coming back to the piece from a few days before means the mind is fresh again. The fresh mind picks better up imperfections and is more willing to fix things. We improve only when we create a certain intensity of concentration, are less forgiving and more eager to get it better. And once through is not a good method. I found also out that when I practice something quite intense, like play a section three to five times, maybe repeat it the day later to foster what I practiced, I may then let it rest for a few days. A lot of practice time is wasted by just checking if you can play something okay. Can I still play it? Without practicing it really. And from a viewpoint of learning, it's just a waste of time. Unless you do it just for fun, like just playing in the evening. And that's absolutely brilliant. A good option is to focus on one thing at a time, like only bowing, then only the rhythm, next only intonation. And then we put it together and we judge after what needs more work. This fits in very well with the aspect of always have one goal, what to improve. You might remember the evening is not a good time to get new details right, but it's the best time to play pieces through musically, safe ones for real enjoyment. Well, I wish you got something out of this video and I hope your learning process will quicken now and you will find some extra time to enjoy playing. A second how to practice best video will follow, focusing on how to build a repertoire, to be able to keep many pieces virtually permanent up at a higher level without too much effort, including even getting better at them. And goodbye for now.